Good morning. I want to welcome everyone if you're visiting with us today. We're going to ask you to stick around for a couple minutes afterwards that we might get a chance to greet you and get to know you a little bit. A few announcements before we get started. Remember, this will be recorded for uh, those who can't be here. It will be on YouTube. It will also be on uh, Facebook Live. We want to make sure that everyone has communion. If you are here and don't have a communion packet, raise your hand and we'll get one to you. Uh, there are extra communion packets in the tote in the carport. If you uh, are at home and you have need of those, you can stop by and pick them up anytime. Or if you can't stop by, you can contact one of us and we'll get them to you. We always like to remind everyone that we are having Wednesday night Bible study at 7 o'clock on Wednesday evenings on Zoom. You can go right to the website and click link to Wednesday night and uh, you will be brought into that. It's been a great study. It's, it's uh, very uplifting in the middle of the week. Remember after closing prayer, we will dismiss from the back of the auditorium and proceed outside. Uh, with that said, a uh, few congregational announcements. We lost our brother Tony Malta yesterday. Uh, he passed away at home, comfortable, so keep uh, Fran and the family in your prayers. And there will be a short ladies' meeting right here on front, uh, right after service this morning, to talk about uh, talk about the possibilities of a luncheon. So. Um, if you're able to help, if you can stick around for a couple minutes, meet right up here, that'd be great after closing prayer. Keeping your prayers, uh, the son and daughter-in-law and baby of uh, Dana Rogers. Uh, we announced last week that there are some concerns with the baby's heart. He is due very soon and they are gonna induce labor this week. Uh, they were concerns that they might have to do surgery right away, but they are feeling a little more like uh, it won't be right away. So keep praying for that and uh, keep that family in your prayers. Don McElhaney is recovering from surgery at home, so keep him in your prayers. Don's nephew, Dwayne Teal, 57 years old, passed away in Tennessee from complications from COVID, so keep them in your prayers. Keeping your prayers, uh, Marvin's study, as we have announced before, we've had some baptisms due to that. Some of Marvin's co-workers, ex-co-workers, Ken Williams and Paul Shaw, were baptized here due to uh, their studying with Marvin. So keep that in your prayers. Uh, we, will, we are talking about and we are planning to have a picnic out here on the lawn in July for our graduates. We generally have a, a little potluck every year for our graduates and this year we're going to try to have a picnic in July so keep that in your prayers if you are graduating this year from uh, school or college make sure that we know that we think we know but you know could be that you're graduating we don't know it and bring us pictures so uh, Keep that in your prayers. We are also talking about when we can get back to Sunday school, when we can get back to uh, in-person Wednesday night. So keep us in your prayers as we continually uh, try to keep our finger on the pulse and, and try to make those decisions. I know we have been asked about mask wearing in the building. Um, we do want to continue mask wearing in the building until more of the kids can be, uh, as I'm standing here with my mask in my hand, if we're up here, we take them off. Uh, we want to continue mask wearing in the building until more of the kids can be vaccinated. That is all the announcements I have at this time. If you would, uh, let's go to God in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and we thank you, dear Lord, for all the many blessings you've given us, most of all for your son. We are thankful for this opportunity to gather together this morning. We are Prayerful, dear Lord, that our worship service will be uplifting and edifying to everyone here, but most of all, dear Lord, we pray that our worship is acceptable to you. These things we pray, dear Lord, in your son Jesus' name. Amen.
Good morning. If you would open your songbooks with me to number one. Number one, our God, he is alive. If you're able, let's stay with us. That's new. That's new. I was going to ask you guys to stay with us. As soon as I said it, he was up like a shot. I mean, he knew. As soon as he saw this song, he knew. There is. Scripture reading will be taken from the book of Luke. Chapter 14, verse 15 to 24. 
I will be reading from the New Revised Standard. <clears throat> One of the dinner guests, on hearing this, said to him, Blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. Then Jesus said to him, Someone gave a great dinner and invited many. At the time for the dinner, he sent his slaves to say to those who had been invited, come, for everything is ready now. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said to him, I brought a piece of land and I must go see it. Please accept my regret. Another one said, I bought five yoke of oxen and I'm going to try them out. Please accept my regrets. Another one said, I have just been married, and therefore I cannot come. So the slave returned and reported to his master. Then the owner of the house became angry and said to his slave, go out at once into the street and lanes of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. And the slave said, to, said sir, what you order has been done, and there is still room. Then the master said to the slave, go out onto the roads and the lanes and compel people to come in, to come in so that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those who were invited will taste my dinner. That was from the book of Luke, chapter 14, verse 15 through 24. Will you bow with me? Our Heavenly Father, we come before with you, Lord, with humble hearts and joyful to the blessed opportunity that we have, dear Lord, to come together as one family and worship you, Lord. We pray that all the things that will be done this very morning, from the communion, the singing to the message that we will be hearing. Everything may be done in accordance to your will and it's edifying to you, Lord, and pleasing to your ears. We pray that you be with everybody here this morning. Be the encouragement that can only come from you, dear Lord, to have our heart fully focused on you, dear Lord. Fully focus on this moment of worship. Help us to rid of all worldly thoughts. And we pray, dear Lord, that you be with all those that were mentioned this morning. Our brother Tony passing, dear Lord, and be with friend, the family, dear Lord, for we understand how trying it is to lose a loved one. We are just grateful, Lord, that we can lean on you. We can focus on the hope that we have through your son. We pray, dear Lord, that you be with Dana's family. You be with the McElhaney's family, dear Lord. Many others that are still struggling, not only with health, but financial stress, Father, and emotional stress. Be with those that are undergoing treatments and procedures, testing. Have them lean on you, dear Lord, for the calmness, the peace that can only be obtained by staying in fellowship with you, dear Lord. We are thankful for those who are visiting here this morning with us. We pray that everything that is done here and said will be also an encouragement to them. But again, dear Lord, we pray that it is acceptable to you. We with our brother Brian as he has prepared the lesson for us. Continue to bless his efforts. Continue to keep him and his family safe, dear Lord. Continue to give them the encouragement to keep going and keep pushing. 
be with each and every one of us now, Lord, as we continue this service. And we, most of all, we thank you for your son and the price he paid on Calvary on our behalf. Forgive us, Father, for our many shortcomings. Continue to be patient with us, Father, and for that we are thankful and grateful. These things we ask and pray for in Jesus' name. Amen. Before we partake of the Lord's Supper, let's turn and sing number 318. Number 318, there is a place of quiet rest. for the body. Heavenly Father, we come to you at this time so thankful for this opportunity to be here, Father, for any amount of health and, and breath and life that you give us in our bodies here and in this lifetime, Father, that we can use them in accordance with your will, live our lives in a way that shows understanding and desire for 
your work. Father, we thank you for Christ and the life that he lived and the body that he inhabited, Father, that he could experience a life just as we have, Father. We thank you for the example that he gave, the lessons that he taught in his word. Father, we again thank you for the body that came, the life that was lived, that experience and sacrifice that he made and that you made, Father. We thank you for that, for this bread that it represents in Christ's name. Now peel back the second portion, exposing the cup. Please bow with me as we give thanks for the cup. Heavenly Father, we come to you now so thankful for this cup and the blood that it represents, Father, the precious and perfect blood of your Son without sin, without fault, that he came and shed for us, that redeemed us, that purchased us, that made us family, that made us whole, for the perpetual cleansing power of it, Father, that prepares us for eternity with you and him and each other, Father, if we hold to your word and your ways and strive to thankfulness for your glory and grace. Father, we thank you so much for the blood and the cup that represents it, Father, in Christ's name. Amen. This concludes the Lord's Supper. This time, we have an opportunity to give back to this contribution. We if you bow with me in prayer as we prepare to give back. Heavenly Father, we come to you at this time so thankful for all of the resources that you put in our hands, Father, we know that it comes from you. Any amount of strength, our jobs, our health, financially, any of the, the things that you put in our lives, Father, we know that it comes from you and can be put to your work. We pray that we have the proper mindset about each of these things in our lives, Father. Pray you be with those who are about to give. In this particular way, may you be with each of us that we examine ourselves and assess how we can work in your kingdom, Father. We pray you be with those who are over these funds, that they continue to, to do their best to utilize them in ways that spreads your word. We know that we each have an ability to do so, Father, and we pray you be with us this time as we give in Christ's name.
want to say good morning to you. Again, express how great it is to see everyone. How great it is to be here. Another glorious day, glorious first day of the week where we can gather together to worship our Heavenly Father in spirit and truth. Glorious privilege, glorious honor to do so, and also a glorious privilege to do so with God's people. This morning we want to talk to you from the subject, uh, the spirit of the invitation. The spirit of the invitation. This will not uh, be the only sermon um, of this type. We will um, have more sermons throughout the year that denote um, this idea, the spirit of the invitation. If you would, go with me to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Our God and Father, we thank you and we Indeed, praise you for everything you've given to us and everything you've done. We pause now to thank you for your son and our savior who has made all of this possible, dear Father. We pray that as we study your word together, Lord, that we again are learning the value of developing more and more a receptive heart and a meek attitude, Lord, knowing that through meekness that we're able to receive your word which has the ability to save our souls we pray that we're learning the value of looking past the speaker with his weaknesses his shortcomings and looking to you knowing that everything that is good and right and true and eternal belong to you and all the mistakes belong to the speaker and all that is eternal belong to you these things we pray and ask in Jesus glorious name Amen. Part of the worship service that we involve ourselves in, even up to this point today, on the first day of the week, is what is commonly known as the invitation. In other words, when we participate in a corporate setting like this, a corporate worship, what you will find is um, a part of the worship which is often described as the invitation or extending the invitation. And it is extremely essential, an essential part of the worship uh, of our great God through his son, Jesus Christ. It, it typically comes at the end of the sermon, but is actually, again, part of the message when you, when you think about it, and which it is followed by a relevant song. Now, by relevant, we mean a song reflective of the New Testament teaching on the subject of God's grand and glorious invitation that he makes to the world. And the purpose of this relevant song is to further urge anyone considering obeying the command, it's to encourage them to come. And even presents further arguments or further reasons why the individual that is contemplating coming, that they come. Some congregations of the Lord's Church include the time of worship known as the invitation and their description, when you look at their website, in other words, you will find that as they're describing what you can expect when you visit a church of Christ, they have descriptions of the invitation right there on certain websites because they understand, again, the importance of this part of the worship. Now, the reason any emphasis is placed on this part of worship or why it is even included is because of the New Testament and emphasis on the idea of man receiving this grand invitation from God himself, because that's how we ought to think about it, this grand invitation that God himself has presented to us. So the question becomes, what is the invitation? Or what is man being invited to? See, the answer to that is multivariate. Really, you, you can't answer that in one way. The answer to that is a multivariate uh, answer. Because unlike the invitations that we all get from one another, like a birthday invitation or a wedding invitation, where rejection of that particular invitation simply means, or at the most, it means missing out on a wonderful event or missing out on wonderful uh, memories, 
When one rejects the invitation from God, rejecting God's invitation not only causes us to miss out on all that the kingdom has to offer, but rejection ultimately means accepting the alternative. We have to understand that. When you reject God's invitation, you are in essence accepting an invitation somewhere else and of another kind. And that is what? God's eternal judgment. One so-called uh, pastor said concerning God's invitation, and, and please hear me. He said concerning God's invitation that it's a mistake to assume that the gospel is a command. He says that it's an offer. He says it's simply this wonderful offer of God. Now, the reality is, is that there is some truth to that. When we think about the invitation that is described in the New Testament scriptures, we have to think of it, and we'll talk about that in terms today of this grand and glorious offer. But what is also true is that the gospel and the invitation to receive it is a command as well. It's a command as well because the invitation is a call to come back to the one that we were created to serve. It's a call back. It is a call to come back, denoting that when you come and when you accept the invitation, you are denoting and admitting that you have done what? That you at one time have transgressed against God, and now you're reconciling to God. It's a command. But it's also a command because it is a call to live a life that we were designed to live in the beginning, and that is an obedient life from the heart. And when you accept that invitation that God offers, you are obeying the command to what? To live an obedient life from the heart. It's a command too. An offer, but it's a command. Therefore, the invitation can be defined as God's call to man to come back to him through his son in order to receive his earthly his e and his eternal fruit and avoid the wrath for those who reject him. This is the reason that Jesus, and we often associate the idea and the concept of this invitation with Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. This is why Jesus says what? Come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am meek and lowly at heart, and you shall find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy, Jesus says, and my burden is what? It's light. And for those brief moments that we talk about the extending of the invitation, those brief moments in worship, we are instructing and we are reminding men that God is inviting them to do what? To come. Come to him through his son. The powerful thing about Acts chapter 2, for those of us that are familiar with this, this grand and glorious day and this occasion, and, and really the the first day of the church age when Peter preaches the first gospel sermon on the day of Pentecost after the Lord's resurrection, the first sermon after the Lord's resurrection. The interesting thing about that is, is that not only does Peter announce that the doors of the kingdom have been opened, but have you ever noticed that Peter kind of gives what we would describe as an extending of the invitation at the end of his sermon? I know that I'm right about it because in Acts chapter 2, and, and please turn with me there, in Acts chapter 2, look at what the Holy Spirit says concerning these things. Look at verse number 37. So Peter has already preached to the house of Israel about the Messiah, and he has proven that Jesus is the Christ. And so the Bible says in verse 37 that now when they heard this, they were cut or pricked to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, men and brethren, or brothers, what should we do? Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. But don't stop there because in verse number 40, look at what the Bible says. The Bible says, that, and he testified with many other arguments and exhorted them saying, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. So those who welcomed his message were baptized. Those who welcomed the invitation were baptized and that day about 3,000 persons were added. They devoted themselves to the apostles teaching and fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. That's an invitation that was extended. And it is very reminiscent of what we typically do every first day of the week 
at the end of the message. Therefore, this morning, I want to attempt to embody the spirit of the invitation, this time, this three to five minutes that we typically, as preachers, set aside to try to urge individuals who have heard a message previously to come. Think of this sermon itself in its entirety as the invitation being extended. Now to those who have, have not come to him and who have not obeyed the glorious invitation, we urge you to come. And to those that need to be restored, at the appropriate time we, we ask that you come. Because not every gospel sermon is, is Every gospel sermon, should we say, is a call to respond, but today I want us to regard this message as extending or laying out or stretching out the invitation, the presentation of arguments and exhortations for those who need to, for them to come. Now the text comes this morning, and I'm going to ask you to turn to Luke chapter 14, and I know we read it uh, together with our brother Vince, and we're going to um, go through it again as we preach this message. But today's passage comes from Luke chapter 14, verses 15 through 24. The verse opens by referring to a dinner guest that upon hearing something that Jesus says, the Bible says that this dinner guest responds by saying, blessed is anyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. Blessed is anyone, he says, who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. Now to understand this statement and the parable about the kingdom, we must at least go back to the very first verse of this chapter because this is where we learn that Jesus himself has been invited to dine in the house of religious, religious leaders. Speaking about invitation, the Lord was invited to dine in the, guest, in the house of a Pharisee. He's a guest. The Bible tells us that it's on a Sabbath day, and the passage says that they were watching Jesus closely. If you look at what the Bible says, the Bible says that they invite him, but it was not for good reasons. The Pharisees and these religious leaders, they want to watch Jesus to see if he would do something that they can indict him for. And so the Bible says that suddenly before him there's a man who has a condition known as dropsy. Dropsy is simply a condition where fluids uh, accumulate in the body and it, it fills the tissue and it fills the skin of that individual, making life almost unbearable, uh, if you will understand it in that manner. So now we know that this is an attempt to trap Jesus. They already had witnessed him heal on the Sabbath in previous days on previous Sabbaths, and they want to accuse Jesus as they did in the past of breaking the law or breaking the Sabbath of God. So Jesus now, understanding this, he asks them a question. Is it lawful to cure people on the Sabbath or not? Notice that. I like the way that Jesus phrases that. It's a powerful statement. Is it lawful to cure people on the Sabbath or not? What does that or not denote? Jesus says, is it lawful for us to help folk, to do good, to bring healing to folk on the Sabbath, or is it more lawful to leave them alone in their condition? That's what Jesus is saying. Powerful when you look at it. The Bible says they didn't respond whatsoever. They said nothing. So Jesus does what? He, number one, he cures this man's condition. He, he heals the man of his condition. But number two, I want you to notice that the Bible says, and it's very important that you understand this, the Bible says that Jesus then sends the man away. In other words, this feast that Jesus was invited to, Jesus sends the man away from this feast. And we will get to the reason for that in a moment. In other words, Jesus is saying that you are not of the same fiber, of the same caliber of these folk that are in this place. And so he sends this man away. And then number three, he convicts them through a parable as hypocrites for violating the very Sabbath that they attempted to accuse him of breaking. But the Bible also says, if you will follow along, that during this same dinner, Jesus sees that the other guests have chosen for themselves places of honor. Under Jewish custom, in proximity to the host, 
Whoever sat closest to the host, it denoted that they were the most honored individuals that were invited here. And so I want you to notice that these individuals, Jesus tells us, the passage implies that they were not seated by the host. They looked at themselves as super important. And so they what? They sat themselves in the places that they believed that they deserved to sit. They honored themselves, in other words. And so the Bible tells us something powerful that Jesus tells them a parable about what? About humility. And I want you in your mind's eye to go back to this day. Look at this, this, this grand feast that the Lord has been invited to. Think about the religious leaders of that day. Think about a, a host of people coming. And I want you, it, based upon the implication of the passage, I want you to notice that the Bible implies that these folk are rich individuals. These are folk that are of prestige in terms of the world. These are folk that are wealthy, that are, are, are important, and they are famous in their communities. And, and mingled in that, there are the implications that he has relatives that are here as well. And so these individuals, the Bible says they take places of honor. They have seats of honor based on these ideas of their importance, earthly importance. And so the Bible says in verses 8 through 11, this parable went this way. Jesus says, when you are invited by someone to a wedding banquet, do not sit down at the place of honor in case someone more distinguished than you has been invited by your host. And the host who invited both you of you may come and say to you, give this person your place. And then in disgrace, you would start to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit down at the lowest place so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves, Jesus says, will be what? Will be exalted. Powerful. Jesus teaches them about humility. Humility, having a mind, a lowly spirit, where we really measure ourselves not by human standards, not by how much we have or our wealth or how famous we are or how many friends we have, but based on heavenly standards. And then notice that the Bible describes that Jesus in verses 12 through 14, after he addresses the 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 individuals that took these places of honor, notice that the Bible says that then Jesus does what? He tells a parable to the host himself. Now, I want to take you back, if you will. And in your minds, I picture all of these things happening. In order for us to understand where we're going, we have to first understand the verses previous to this. So Jesus addresses the host because Jesus tells this man that the folk that he invited are not the right folk that he should have had eat at this feast. See, it disturbed Jesus, a selfless man himself, who always thought of others over and above himself to see this host give a dinner where he was actually thinking about what he could do and how he could profit from it. And so Jesus says to this man in these verses, he says, listen, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors in case they may invite you in return and you would be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Jesus says, that's not the folk that you invite because you can get something from them. Invite folk who, who, you, who can't pay you back. Show your humility, show your love, and show your selfless mindset. So I, I want you to understand that Jesus indicts everybody in the room, everyone that was invited, Every guest that this man had, Jesus has a word of rebuke and exhortation for everyone. That's why he initially did what? Sent the man with dropsy, this innocent victim, away. He did not fit the caliber of these individuals of high-mindedness, of selfishness. Jesus sent him away. He convicts everyone at the dinner. Now, if you can, in your mind's eye, if you are back in the first century, at that particular feast, then you know that all of this must have brought a pretty quiet moment. 
You probably in your mind's eye, you, you've been in those uncomfortable situations where, where something is said of truth, where the individuals did not expect to hear it, but it shook everyone to the core that there's nothing to be said and there's some silence for a moment. And that's the idea that's being pictured here because this silence that comes from Jesus indicting everyone there is why the man, the Bible says, seemingly to break the awkwardness of this truth, this guest exclaims, blessed is anyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. It was not because he himself looked at all of this and thought about the glorious event. He actually was trying to break the awkwardness and he actually believed that he was worthy of this feast that was in the kingdom, and that would be in the kingdom. And Jesus basically tells all of them that with their attitude, with their mindset, he tells them who is worthy. He tells them another parable, what our brother Vince read to us this morning, where the Lord compares the kingdom of God to someone giving a great and a glorious, a, in other words, a giant, sumptuous dinner, and this man invites many. In the scriptures, the word many oftentimes denotes an unlimited number. And Jesus uses the illustration of a dinner. Not only because of the occasion, because the Lord in his wisdom takes this occasion to teach a very powerful spiritual lesson, but because the Jews themselves believe that the Messiah would invite them to a dinner. In the time of the Messiah, he would invite the Jews to dinner often, and the Messiah would invite them in his kingdom to banquets of honor, and that they would receive honor when the Messiah came into his kingdom. And so it's with that understanding that I want to present to you in the spirit of extending the invitation, several arguments from this passage of scripture as to why those who have not yet come should come to Jesus. The first reason in this particular passage, the first argument and exhortation, why those who have not obeyed the gospel and have come to Jesus should come to Jesus is because coming to him and entering his kingdom is like accepting an invitation to the greatest dinner known to man. In other words, when you come down the aisle and sit in one of these places, on one of these seats, with the mindset of accepting the gospel call, of obeying the gospel, this means, number one, that you are coming to the Lord Jesus himself and that you are initially in understanding the, the importance of entering into his kingdom, and entering into his kingdom is likened to accepting and saying yes to this grand invitation to eat in his, in his kingdom, at his table. It's a yes. Every Christian that has, that, has, that has ever come to the Lord, every individual that has ever obeyed the gospel, shall we say, in essence, based upon the words of the Lord Jesus, has said emphatically, yes, I will come to your feast. See, this is a kingdom parable, and, and I want us to understand this. It's not a parable about heaven. Don't confuse Jesus' teaching with what he is talking about, this feast in heaven. He is talking about his kingdom. And again, in Jewish culture, whenever a dinner or a banquet was being prepared, the day of that dinner was announced. Understand that. Whenever someone would, would have a dinner or a great feast and they would, wanted folk to come, they would simply tell them the date of that feast, but they did not necessarily specify the time. And so when Jesus is telling this parable, they understand these things. But on that day of the feast, what would happen is that when everything was ready, when all of the meal was prepared and all of the festivities were all set, the host would then send servants out and they would tell those that were invited to come for now everything is what? It's ready. Everything is ready. Well, in Acts chapter 2, Peter announced that the master's dinner is ready. In Acts chapter 2, when we look at the day of Pentecost, when we see Peter preaching that gospel sermon, the first gospel sermon after the Lord's resurrection. In essence, what we are witnessing in scripture is Jesus, is Peter, I'm, saying, I'm sorry, basically telling us that the master's dinner is ready. All things are ready. Now what? As the song says, come to the feast. There's a reason why the Bible says in Acts chapter 2, 
Verse number 14, that but Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them, men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. And he lists and he, he talks about what, what Joel spoke of in his message in Joel chapter number two. Peter is laying before them that what we have heard as Jews, what was promised to us, the day of the Messiah and the coming of his kingdom, Peter is in essence saying what? That all things are ready now, come to the Messiah's feast. Come to the feast. That's what Acts chapter two, it denotes. Peter announced that the master's dinner is ready. And all that we do as preachers of the gospel, at the end of a gospel message, when we are so-called extending an invitation, we're simply informing and reminding individuals that all things have been ready for 2,000 years. You need to come to the feast. This is the most grand and the most important dinner that you have ever been invited to. Now, Lord willing, tomorrow there will be, a, what is it, Memorial Day? And you have probably been invited to be with family and to be with friends. And that's a glorious day. It's a glorious day for our nation. It's a glorious day for families. But that is not a dinner like the dinner that the Lord invites all of us to come to. And we say to you in the spirit of those three to five minutes of invitation, in the spirit of the gospel message, understand that coming to him means that you say emphatically to him yes. I will come to your feast. But number two, from this passage, it means that this feast, this banquet, is a joyous occasion. Understand that this feast that is described by the Lord Jesus is a joyous occasion. You say, preacher, what do you mean by that? I'm saying to you that we know this, that given the nature of the banquet in Jewish culture, when you study Jewish culture, even when you look at our own culture, if we were talking about a grand feast, a, a glorious dinner and we were inviting folk and we were talking about all of the delicacies that would be there, we are in essence, we're not talking about a somber moment, Matthew, we're talking about a festive occasion. We, even when we do our, our potlucks here, it's a time where we're not in mourning, it's a time where we get together and there's laughter and we expect to enjoy one another's company. And so when Jesus talks about this feast of the Messiah, this feast of his kingdom, he is talking about a, not a somber and a sad occasion, but a, a joyous occasion. I'm saying to you that being a part of the Lord's church is, is a time of joy. It is it's a state of joy, not of one of sadness. Therefore, understand that coming to him and entering his kingdom is likened to a glorious festive event. See, the idea of the Christian life whether we present it falsely ourselves or whether folks just look at it erroneously, is often taken to be a life of agony. I don't know many Christians that, that live the Christian life like they're in agony. There are some, I'm sure. And there are some folk in Christ who, who have not fully understood the concept uh, that Jesus is teaching here, and, and they look sometimes as Christianity as a burden more than they do in the manner in which the Lord is, is, is saying. But Christianity is, is not a life of agony. It's not a life that is designed to be a life of sadness. And instead of truly seeing it as the festive gathering that it is, based upon what the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22, that's how it's described, being a part of the Lord's church, being a part of a festive gathering, that's the way that we ought to look at it instead of looking at it with sadness and somber, somber attitude. We often, before we come to Christ, folk often associate becoming a Christian as like coming instead of, of this festive gathering, like going to a funeral. But the kingdom is like, Jesus says, a great banquet, a great banquet where there is a feast for the soul. Think about that. A feast for the soul. And, and man needs that. We live in a world that is dark, that is evil, that is, is full of, of all types of corruption and, and moral decay. And, and aren't you glad that the Lord has, has perched in this sinful world a kingdom where we can have joy? Aren't you glad? 
Aren't you glad that there is a kingdom where there is it's described as a great banquet because it is a feast for the soul, that when the soul is hungry for something more than money, that the, there's the church and the Lord's kingdom and there's the word of God and there's everything that denotes the church to fill the soul. And when a person is thirsty, the Lord has provided the glorious waters of the spirit to replenish us in a, in a deserted and a weary land. This earth, it can be described as a deserted and a weary land, but the Lord did not leave us alone in this place without providing for us all that we need to make it and to have a glorious and an abundant life. See, the kingdom is not only a feast for the soul, but the kingdom, we ought to have joy because it's a feast of loved ones. Think about, look at all of these folk around here. Now, when we, when we say the final prayer, just look, we're a small congregation, but look at the folk that are a part of your family. Look at it. We are blessed because of the folk here. We are loved by these folk here. Look at this mighty family in the Lord. Think about the mighty family that's across Eight Mile. Think about the mighty family that we have on the west side. Think about the mighty family that's north to the north of us. We are a blessed people because we have been gathered to a, a festive gathering where we, are, we feast with what? With loved ones. We're not sitting at the table, Matthew. With strangers, we have loved ones. We are loved, and we're loved by the Almighty. There's a reason why in Acts chapter 2, the Bible says that they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and, and their teaching and the breaking of bread and prayers. There's a reason why the Bible describes the first century church as loving to be together and spending much time day by day in one another's homes because it's a feast of loved ones. But we ought to understand it and see it as a joyous occasion because the kingdom is a feast of safety and protection. The devil can't touch us. Now, we don't go through this life unscathed. We don't go through this life without scars. But the devil cannot, he cannot snatch us out of the Lord's hands, provided we, we abide in his word. The devil has all type of evil plans and evil plots against every single one of us in this place. But aren't you glad that the Lord says, not my child protection and safety. I, I think that's a, a festive gathering. That's a feast there. It's a feast because not only is the kingdom a feast of safety and protection from evil and the enemy's schemes and from sin and deceit and falsehood, but it's a feast because it's a feast of peace. You never knew peace like you've known peace in the Lord Jesus. That's a guarantee. If you really know peace in Christ, you know that there's no type of peace that compares to it. That's a feast that we did not always have, but we have in the Lord. Philippians chapter 4, the peace that surpasses all understanding which guards our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. The kingdom is a feast of peace. It's a kingdom that's a feast of grace. Romans chapter 8 verse 1, the Bible says that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We have not been brought into this festive gathering so that the Lord can dispel us to our room. You leave the table and you go away. That's not the type of feast that we have been called to. We are a part of a feast where when we even cut up at the table, you know, some of us that know, that have raised kids, we know that our children, when they were younger, that they can cut up at the table. But the Lord just, he corrects us and he says, now continue to eat. Aren't, aren't you glad that we are in God's grace? The Bible says in John chapter 1 that we have received in him grace upon grace. Even what the Bible teaches, the, the concept, and we even sing songs about it, that when we go to heaven, that the gates swing outward never. That's because of God's grace. We are under a law of grace that when we, when we sin and when we are contrite, that God, what, he, he gives us his grace. That's a feast. And we have a kingdom that is indicative of hope. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13, I don't want you to grieve as others who have no hope. We even have a different grief when we lose folk like our brother Tony. But we know where Tony placed his, his faith. And we have that hope. The Hebrew writer says in Hebrews chapter 6 that this hope is a sure and a steadfast anchor of the soul. The devil cannot rob us of that hope. That's a feast. And Jesus talks about this glorious feast. He describes and he likens it 
to a feast. I want to read those verses. And we're, we're almost out of time, but we only have a couple more of these in, in, in invitation style. They're bullet points. And so, but look at what he says here. Look at the Lord Jesus in his words when he talks about this, this feast. He says, and then Jesus said to him, someone gave a great dinner and invited many. A great dinner that is able to what? Feed many. That means that this table is, has all the delicacies that man could ever dream of. Great dinner. All that man could ever need. That simple line, this great dinner. But number three, we need to come to him because no earthly affair, no earthly business is worth missing this feast. You can't name a thing pertaining to this life that is worse that is worth missing this glorious invitation. There's nothing. And I want you to look at what Jesus says here. Look at what he describes here in this parable. He says, at that time for the dinner, he sent his slaves to say to those who had been invited, come, for everything is ready now. But they all alike. That's how in the Greek it means that, they, that this was indicative of every one of them. They all alike began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a piece of land and I must go out and see it. Please accept my regrets. Another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I'm going to try them out. Please accept my regrets. Now, some of us may say, well, that would never be me. Well, now look at the third example that the Lord uses. Jesus gets really personal because he says, another said, I have just been married and therefore I cannot come. He, he, he leans on domestic reasons. Now, it doesn't mean that domestic reasons and, and family issues are not important. God is the creator of the family. But the Lord says that in terms of this feast, there is nothing, there is no reason that you ought to miss this feast. There is no reason, in other words, that you should not obey the gospel and obey the gospel call. Everything else is just an excuse. You may think that it's a viable reason, but in actuality, it's just an excuse. The Bible says that all three individuals believe that their reasons for rejecting the master's invitation was a good one, but in reality, Jesus describes it as an excuse. Their responses simply showed the man that invited them that they really didn't value the banquet that he prepared. And when a person hears the gospel call, <clears throat> excuse me, they are in essence, when they reject it, they are basically telling God that they don't value this great dinner. Since they previously, these individuals were told, again, they were told the day of the feast. Think about that importance. They were told, not the hour, but the day of the feast. And yet, Matthew, they still schedule things on the day of this great feast. That shows you that they did not, what, value this great invitation. They didn't value it. And when people know that God requires their attendance and that we cause them to enter into his kingdom and to be a part of this glorious feast, but they invoke themselves too heavily and involve themselves too mightily in worldly affairs. They are showing that they have chosen the world over the kingdom. When you pick a job that you know is going to keep you from serving God, when you pick a spouse that you know will keep you from serving God, you are in essence saying to God that I know the call, but there are more important things to me. You're telling him that it's not important. You're making excuses. We shouldn't let our homes, the comfortability of our homes, our jobs, the pursuit of wealth, our friends, our family, or even the pleasures of this life keep us from accepting the invitation. No earthly affair is worth missing the feast. And then finally, actually there are two more very quickly. This feast welcomes any and every kind. I'm going to simply read these and the lesson will be yours. Look at verse 21. This feast welcomes any and every kind. The Bible says in verse 21, so the slave returned and reported this to the master. Then the owner of the house became angry and said to his slave, go out at once into the streets and lanes and towns and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. And the slave says, sir, what you have ordered has been done and there is still room. Now don't look at that in terms of that not fitting you. 
You say, I have all of my fingers, I have all of my toes, and I have a couple of aches and pains, but I'm in relative health. Jesus is describing folk in spiritual conditions, and that fits all of us. That was all of us at one time, and it, from times in our lives, it still fits us. Because some of us uh, have been, we were spiritually blind, spiritually lame, and the Lord still, Romans chapter 5, he says, but I still value you, and I still love you, and through my son, even though you are enemy of mine, I'm going to initiate reconciliation. And he's initiated it to the whole world. John 3, 16, for God so loved the cosmos, the world that he gave his one and only son. That includes every individual of every nation, gender, whatever it is. God invites you to come and to be his. The feast welcomes any and every kind. And then finally, to enter this feast... You must enter through Jesus. We've implied it all throughout the message. The scriptures implied here and the, all the New Testament scriptures as well as the old imply it. That in order to have this feast, you must enter through Jesus. For there is salvation in no other name. In heaven or on earth, given among men by which we must be saved. The church, the kingdom belongs to Christ Jesus. Matthew chapter 16, beginning verse 13. Acts chapter 20, verse 28. He purchased it with his own blood. This kingdom, it belongs to him. And you cannot jump over Jesus to enter into the kingdom. You have to accept him. That means you have to obey the gospel of Jesus the Christ through faith, repentance, confession, and being baptized into Christ, into his death, Romans chapter 6, for the remission of his sins. We're going to talk later in this series on those very things about the obedience to the gospel and God's plan to save you as he helps you to enter in. And so we implore you today that if you have not obeyed the gospel, won't you obey the gospel and accept the invitation and Christ's call to come. And if you are a Christian and you need to come during this sermon that embodies, we hope, the spirit of the invitation, won't you come right now as well while we all together stand and while we all sing.
bow in prayer. Dear most gracious Lord, we come to you thanking you for blessing us all with another day. We thank you for this opportunity to come out and worship you. We pray that, that we all had open hearts and clear minds to receive your word today, and that we just join your kingdom, join your church, and follow you and be servants for you. We pray that, that you be with anybody that is, has not followed you, that you soften their hearts and that you just touch them in a way so they can. We pray that, that you be with all of us as we depart here, that you keep us in your hand and keep us safe throughout the day. And we just thank you for your word and the guidance that you give us each and every day. It's in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen.